job and you settle down But there's always something in my mind Saying this is not my town Each morning when I wake up And I start a brand new day I look forward to going back to home Might turn into a fishing podcast for a moment Let's go turn it down then I know you a long time yeah. We were in a band together Many, many years ago. Many, many, would many. You, would, you, would you hazard a guess at how many years that is? Um, I was um, actually coming up in the car, it kind of went through my head. I was thinking maybe in on 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So about 20, yeah, 27, 28 years ago. Yeah, yeah, hitting <laughs> on the 30 year mark. Back yeah. in the day. So I know you a very, very long time. Yeah. As a fabulous singer, a songwriter, a Galway man, a fisherman. And you've had great success lately, mm. the last number of years with mm. Cherish the Ladies. Mm-hmm. But take us back to where it all started. Well, uh, we'll say my first music adventures would have been, we'll say, I, I was always humming around the house, singing and humming and singing a few songs. So that, that was a natural thing. Um, but that was nothing forced upon me. And then when I came to about maybe seven or eight, um, I remember the dad bringing me down would I call it the old Chivago in the Galway Shopping Centre? I think that's where Chivago once was first. And he brought me in there and he brought me a, a black guitar. Um, and I'll never forget it, it was an okay, it was just in a cardboard kind of box shape of the guitar. And that was brought home. And I started messing around with that for a long time. Couldn't get no rights in it. But that was the first time I, I took a kind of a musical instrument into my hand outside doing a tin whistle in the school, in the local school. <laughs> So uh, I stayed away with that. And at particular time then, there was a, the garage at the top of Bohemore there, uh, across from the new cemetery. That was a very, very raw garage at the time, just two petrol pumps and a, and, and, uh, and a small little shop where you could just buy maybe a, that Pen- time. Penny sweets. Penny sweets. A pack of fags. <laughs> but um, there was a guy working up there. He used to visit and he used to work a very, very odd time fella called Paul Grealish and Paul when I used to go up there Paul would be in there and he'd be chatting to some other the head of a guitar out and he'd be playing his electric guitar so I got very interested talking to him so I, I, I told him I had a guitar down home in the house and could I bring it up and sure enough he said bring it up some even there after school and I brought the guitar up and he showed me a couple of chords and after that then after about six or seven months I tipped away and I started kind of been self-taught really on, on, on the guitar. So that was first musical instrument in the hand. Took a while, you know, steel strings instead of getting the nylon ones at the start. But um, yeah, that was it. I, I found myself an instrument and started, uh, just couldn't make head or head or head or tail of the songs to put them together with the, uh, with the, uh, with the music. But um, just got the books and tapes and stuff. So where, where, where were you in school and what, what was school like? Well, school, school wasn't too bad. School was... School was, um, as Alice Taylor's book, the school through the fields. Our school was just up the road. I mean, literally three minutes. And that was it, less than three minutes. So that, uh, that school uh, was St. Brendan's National School. It's now a used to be Colossian Akuraba at the top of Warmore there. Uh, and it's still a school. It's, a, it's an educational school, um, training courses and stuff like that now. So that was that was our our our, our school and our, our adventure uh, from the house, uh, a three minute walk. I can't remember much music in the school. I can remember bits of tin whistle and stuff like that in most national schools, but I can't remember Anton progressing when a few little plays here and there. But uh, it wasn't until I decided to go down to St Patrick's Brass Band in Galway when I was nine. <laughs> And that's that's kind of really what brought me into an ensemble of music. <laughs> Did you bring the black guitar with you? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't, to be honest with you. But um, we had to go down there on Saturday mornings down to Tommy Joyce, who was the bandmaster, and Peter Rabbit, and all a lot of the lads from around the city uh, were, were, were in the band that time. And, you know, the band would be one of the oldest brass bands um, in the country, I believe, St. Patrick's Brass Band. And um, they were well established, and you know there was a selection of music uh, of musical instruments there that was offered to you. But first of all, you had to learn the manuscripts and be able to write the manuscripts and look at scores and be taught scores and stuff like that. So that was it for kind of six or seven months for me, until then you were 
introduced to. I was introduced to the euphonium. And that was my first what's brass a, instrument. What's the euphonium? The euphonium is like one of the big bass. You know the big basses that they have with the three that they hold here? It was the smaller version of that. Right. And uh, it's quite nice. It's a, there's a nice tone off it, yeah. So you learned how to read music? I learned how to read music, in the, yeah. That was I brilliant, could, though, wasn't I it? Read, I could read. You know, after a certain amount of years, I was sitting in doing concerts all around the country. Um, I moved from the euphonium onto what they call the second cornet. Uh, like the first cornet would be, you know, we'd be taking the lead parts. And the second cornets would be kind of accompanying second cornet and third cornets and stuff like that. So... Here I was after a couple of years, after walking up and down to St. Brendan's, I'm now sitting in a brass band sounds, reading uh, scores. Sounds very posh for Bower Moore, doesn't it? Well, it does, but a lot of the fellas <laughs> that were in, and the girls in the band were from, from Bower Moore as well. And there was a live documentary done, I remember at the time, RTE ran a series of the brass bands of Ireland, and we were picked as one of the bands, so it's funny to look back at that footage now. Wow. It really is. But so I, that was age 9 and 10? That was age yeah. 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe... 14, I'd say definitely up to 14, maybe 15, and uh, that yeah. was it. Like, I, I was there for a while and uh, then just kind of wheeled away from it. Other things then started to distract me, so. Like what? Well. <laughs> now that you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just saw the things. That, the, the, I was very, very interested in sport. I, I, um, I didn't play a bit of sport later on in life. I mean, we all wanted to go down playing Soccer with our local uh, soccer team, Hibernians Football Club, and you'd be gone there Saturday morning, and that was fighting with the band, and uh, then a little bit of hurling with the mellows, you know, a small bit. All that was fighting and mixing up with the times of the band, and uh, eventually I just kind of pulled away from, from the band. Unfortunately, I was, uh, I was, it was a move really that I was sad that I'd done it years after because my father had actually joined the band as well, and he became a flag bearer. Uh, with the band, and he was there. He stayed there a lot, lot longer after I did. What did What did your father do? Because I I met your mother. Yes, well, I my, never met your dad. My, my, in his occupation, is it? Yeah. Yeah, my father was. Uh, most of his life, in the latter part of his life, he he worked in a factory, steel metal fabrication factory, and um, I ended up working there for eight years or so myself. But they started off in Galway City. Uh, that factory, it's now it's. If anyone is familiar with Galway City, there's a big American corporation there, Turnmo King. It used to be Potest before that, and that's where he worked. And they moved out to Connemara, then just outside Spiddle, where uh, there was a factory there, and a couple of the people that were working moved out there, and sheet metal fabrication, that's what he was doing. And I ended up working there on press brakes and power presses and all that, dealing with steel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lucky not to lose a finger, maybe. Yeah, I've seen that happen quite a few times. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have been great for a guitar wouldn't career. Wouldn't be no for a guitar or a, or a left-handed banjo player. <laughs> and, 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 and your mum then, did she, did she work? Well, mum, mum, mum was out. She actually, I remember her in my younger times. Uh, my mum originally came from the Clada. Um, my father's people were up in uh, Taylor's Hill. He, he worked, my grandfather worked in the Dominican convent as the head gardener. And then they moved into Bormore and the Bormore houses were built in the 30s. Uh, so they were they were there. Mum came from the Clada, and she worked in Merlin Park Hospital and the Galway Regional Hospital at the time. She worked in the shop there, going around to the units, bringing around the trolley and the shop and all that. <laughs> and she was a little bit of cleaning as well, you know, in different houses and stuff like that. So she was she was a great worker herself, and he was a great worker, dad as well. So you know, they were they were they were like any other you know couple at that time, you know, striving to pay their bills and. Like any other ordinary couple in life, trying to raise a family. Yeah, yeah. She was a lovely lady because uh, I met her. I was in your house. Yeah, a long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah, yeah she yeah. was a lovely lady. She was. She was. She was. And you know, she only she only passed away there lately. The father was, I think, twenty years past now. But the mother passed away at the beginning of the COVID. She was one of the first to get rattled with the COVID um, and go away. And unfortunately, we weren't able to have uh, a service or a mass or anything for her at the time because. They didn't know what this uh, uh, COVID-19 was involved with. And so it was kind of straight from the hospital to the cemetery with 10 members of the family. So still kind of lingers a bit. You feel that you weren't there to say goodbye and all them kind of things. Uh, you know, people weren't taking COVID serious f at the beginning for a while, but really early into it, we knew it was serious, you know, all my family. So I used to, I used to be laughing, not laughing, but sometimes I'd be looking at people 
looking at the counter arguments and I know everybody has their own personal decision what they do but like we knew it was definitely for real you know so mm. but she was she was she had, she she had a great she had a hard life but she was really she was a great character mm. and she she chewed from the hip you know whatever was coming you get it with both barrels you know yeah yeah. She was very proud of you. I knew that with the music. She was indeed. Like, you know, uh, she she wouldn't say too much in front of me. I knew she was always probably... It's when I wasn't there, I'd get a, I'd get a second hand. <laughs> God, oh, she never stops talking about you. Oh, she's all the time. You know, she's, oh, she's really proud of you. And, and, yeah. and, you know, so... Was there any special gig that you did that she, that, that she was at? Is there anything, well, uh, anything that springs to mind? I think, I think in the... Like, when I launched my first album, and unfortunately my dad just missed out that one, my first solo... Album was in. I launched it in two thousand and six, I think, in the in the town hall theatre in Galway, and I mean, that was a while in in the making, and it was a while been anticipated, but eventually I got around to doing it, and that night, uh, you know, that was a very very special night. I, I was delighted she was there, and I was delighted all my family was there, my current family, and all all my people that surrounded me that support you, as you know, when you're a musician because. A lot of the times we've gone away from home. But that night, to me, now, it sticks out. I've been to a lot of big, big, huge auditoriums around the world and all that, and they're all fantastic in their own right. But that night uh, was a special, uh, special night. Um, I had another another night with, when I went off. Was I was, uh, when Dolores Kane came back for a little uh, tour there a couple of years ago, uh, she had me as a guest. And we had, uh, Dolores had put a band together, John Faulkner, Frank uh, Kelly, and I think Connor and Yvonne, uh, Carmel Dempsey. And we had started doing a few concerts with her in Salt Hill, in the Salt Hill. But the first one outside Galway was in the Olympia in, in Dublin. And the first song she'd sing on the night was Caledonia. So she came out onto the stage and... It was, I t- I, without a doubt, it was 10 minutes of standing ovation for her, you know, before the song was sang at all. Uh, <laughs> and you can you can respectfully understand why that would happen with her. Um, but that to be part of that, especially when I'd been, you know, influenced by her in her singing and her tradition and her, 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 her family's tradition and stuff, which I was close to the bone uh, for, for, for a while there in my, my younger musical ventures. But... Uh, yeah, that was, but the town hall, sorry about drifting a bit, the, the town hall would have been, for me, would have been um, a big accolade, especially after a young fellow going in there to the cinema watching <laughs> cowboy films, you know, you're up on the stage <laughs> presenting a concert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where did the folk music connection come from? Like, could it have been rock and roll or country bands? or? Well, at the very beginning for me, I didn't know where my musical connection was until kind of 2016. Uh, maybe 2017, um, when I found out, like, I knew I was adopted at a very, very early age, but when I came to know and meet and get information on my birth family, then the jigsaw kind of came together to me. But in my early days, uh, believe it or not, now I had two bands that I would just go to the end of the earth for, and one of them was Ten Dizzy, and the other was ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> And, like, the house is just, you know, to this day, I still have a lot of DLPs there. Um, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that live, uh, good rock music. Um, I wouldn't say i call it heavy metal, uh, but I just, I enjoyed real good guitar playing, good hard singing, good beat, good rhythm, great drummers, and that's what threw me to them two bands. And their songs, of course, particularly Tim Dizzy and Phil and all that stuff. So that's the kind of genre I was sucked into. But... Now and again, I'd hear Christy Moore singing, I'd hear Liam Clancy singing, I'd hear Dolores singing, and that would kind of pull me away, you know. It's uh, God, that's that's really nice. That stuff, you know. It's it's. it's I'll have to see what that's all about now soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> so when when did you start? When did you start gigging? When did you start songwriting? Uh, songwriting was kind of up and down for me. Um, I wrote a couple of songs when I was about maybe 13, 14, 15, but they were just kind of, they were poems I was putting together and then I just put a few chords on them on the, uh, on the guitar. I, I, I knew they weren't sitting together, but um, I kind of gave, gave it a skip for a couple of years and came back to it later. I'd say in my, in my 17, 18, 
kind of thing I started taking a, a bit serious um, I wasn't that serious in school with my, with my writing or anything like that at all or or English or Irish um, do you know uh, my teachers uh, the few of them that I've met since I left school uh, that always be you know God <laughs> <laughs> you know where, where was secondary school? secondary school was uh, Two minutes from St. Brendan's, so that was down the hill. St. Brendan's was up the hill, and Monynagisha was down the hill. So five minutes from the house. So <laughs> we didn't have to look at bus passes or maybe a bicycle if it was raining. But, uh, yeah, Monynagisha. And again, that was that was community kind of base, uh, a secondary uh, school, as it was called at the time. But at that time, then, we were meeting people from outside the boundaries of Galway City and the country areas, you know, Cashagar, Tarlock Moor, Clare and Bridge, um, Clare Galway, they used to come in there to Monagisha. So that was, and it was a mixed school as well, so that's, and there I kind of leaned into, I mentioned Paul Grealish earlier on, Paul that I knew in my, in, when I had the first guitar, uh, Paul's brother, uh, Jerry, who has passed away, God rest his soul, uh, he was in the same class as me, and he was more way advanced on the guitar than I was. And uh, we started messing around together, playing a few tunes, and eventually we kind of started uh, practicing and having a few little vis- visitations to each house. And then we hooked up and done a few concerts in the school, which was great, you know. And we um, we moved from that then to do our, our own different things as we as we moved on in life. Um, even when I started going out working when I left school, um, as I said, I worked in the factory with my dad. I worked in some building sites as well um, uh, around Galway. But um, I wouldn't have been playing professionally or anything. I'd go to gigs. I'd go, I'd go on a Friday evening into Taft's in Shop Street there because there was a huge session on a Friday evening. Uh, no, there were sessions on all over the place, but just... I'd be past, you'd hear the music from the street and I'd pass and stand in the corner and uh, be listening and watching. And eventually, after about a year, I said, I, I got the courage. Someone asked me, would I sing a song? Someone that knew me from home. And I did. And after that, then I got a bit of courage. <laughs> courage to sing in public. Yeah. 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 Mm. So that was still like, that was 1920, no? You know, when you think a lot of people would have been in traditional music, would have gone maybe join Kyoto's groups and would have been playing full on, maybe practicing every week. Um, I had been out of the brass band, but um, I hadn't really got... Um, there was a couple of little bands I went into, rock bands. Um, I remember I was in a band with Jimmy Fitzgerald here from Galway. There was a band with my, Mike Chickillen, and, and we'd done a couple of... There was, uh, but I hadn't, hadn't been doing any gigging professionally. But... Uh, it was all a part of getting the confidence up. But, you know, uh, as you know yourself, being a part of a Kyoto's group or um, a group of people that play traditional music every weekend and have a bigger group for practicing or been taught, it's 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 a, l- a little bit easier and you, be, you you get very used to it. So I hadn't been fortunate enough to have been in that situation. So I was just kind of sitting idly back all the time, listening and enjoying and watching. But eventually, slowly, I, I kind of went into it. What what age is that? What what age are we talking about now? Well, we're talking we're talking seventeen, eighteen. Um, I'd been gone. I was gone out of school when I was fifteen, I think. Oh, really? Oh yeah. So yeah. I went I went working. Um, that wasn't uncommon at all. Well, it wasn't. No, it wasn't uncommon uh, at the time. Um, um, and but the thing about it is, when you when you left school, if you left school at fourteen, fifteen. You, you probably went straight into work like I did, you know. Uh, you wouldn't be allowed idle around at home, especially with your parents working. They weren't going to let you sit in your laurels anyways. It's either you stay at school or you go to work, one or the other. Yeah. Uh, so I went working. But uh, that was, yeah. So I'm usually 16, 17, I'd say. 17. And I went into the factory then, 18. And the factory was back in Connemara. And there was a lot of music back in the pubs in Connemara. And I started leaning towards the traditional music. You know, you go into the pubs in Connemara, you have accordions everywhere, <laughs> and um, someone with a guitar, and they're they're singing in Irish or they're singing country music, and uh, there might be fiddles and flutes and stuff. So that that thing got me very interested in in, in we'll say f- folk and traditional music, uh, and and the, and the traditional singing as well. You know, listening to the Connemara people singing Shano songs, their own native songs from that might be a couple of hundred years old. You know, kind of give me a shiver down my back. So that drew me into that situation. Mm-hmm. And I was saying bye-bye to ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Angus Young will be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume he'll get over it. <laughs> I see he should do now at this stage anyway. Yeah. Oh, very good. So yeah. when uh, when did you get married? Well, I went to, a funny thing happened to me. I, I, I went to... I was, I'll speak about this because it, it's a connection with the music and, and me being married and all that. Uh, I went to a wedding. I got friendly with, uh, as, as I say to some of the Cains, Sean Cain and Matt Cain, his brother, and them used to come into Hogan's Bar in Bohemore, where I came from. And Hogan's Bar now would have been classed as a place where people would play cards or the lads that were playing the soccer would come in there after matches. But on a Wednesday night, on a quiet night, would be music down in the corner and we'd be in playing a bit of darts and lo and behold when you look down this band was playing music and I was looking oh god that's fabulous music you know and instead of playing the darts I'd be listening to this so in front of my eyes dead animals been formed and I didn't realise it <laughs> you know so you had you had Johnny Ringo and you had Frankie you had Marching maybe or Jackie Daly and our time coming in and Dolores singing so that used to go on, and Richard and Bridie were very friendly with them. John Prine used to come in there as well, and in and, and the latter times he was very friendly with them. So the music was very near to me all the time, and, and people didn't realise it. So I got friendly with Matt and Sean, and then the, uh, a, a friend of Matt uh, Keynes, um was getting married, Sean Henry. God rest Sean, who passed away there, and I was asked to go to the wedding, and was singing at the wedding uh, after... When the, when, the, when the service was over, we, were, we went to Clifton. And that evening, around in the session, who was playing? And I think today we're talking about the great Joe Burke. And Joe and Anne and a few more of these great traditional musicians were at the wedding. I think Joe was Sean's best man that day. And <clears throat> I got sitting down, I was asked to sing a song or two, and I sang, and Joe was very impressed with my singing. And he... Um, he asked me to come over and sit down beside him and have a chat. And I gave him, he said, I'd like your phone number. And I gave him my phone number. And I'd say about eight or nine weeks later, I got a phone call off him to see, did I want, would I be interested in going to St. Louis in America to uh, a place that he used to resident in himself, a, a pub called John D. McGurk's. And I think a lot of, <laughs> you may have played there yourself. I've never, been in, I've never been in it. Never been but in it's it. world famous. Yes, so, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, um, I, I was asked to go there, and I duly did. And so, um, like, I, I couldn't believe it. It was a big stepping stone for me that, you know, all of a sudden been just kind of on the edge in people's company, singing an odd song. And now, all of a sudden, I'm sitting on stage with Joe Buck and Michael Cooney. Uh, the Piper uh, from Tipperary that lives in St. Louis and it took me a while to get over that even even the first week I played the music I was trying to kick myself you know because I knew the importance of Joe and his music and the huge influence that he had on a lot of musicians all around the world and then that was five weeks and then uh, I was asked to stay for another five weeks after that uh, Tolly and Anne was coming out from, from, from Clare <laughs> uh, you know it's, serious, it's only Tony, like serious company. <laughs> yeah, and and Joe's um, Joe's wife Handbrook was 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 staying on to play with Tony and uh, and I don't. So, the, so that was ten weeks, and like, can you imagine that kind of music in your head for ten weeks? I mean, if you were going to be put into a traditional sound of music, that's either you're either going to love it or hate it, mm -hmm. and that sound will forever and never will always be in my mind. That sound of that music that was played by them individuals will always be with me and it attracted me to the music and after that then I started to meet Marcus Hernan and PJ Hernan and I remember going down with Joe one time to, to Nina and I mean he said they were going to the Paddy O'Brien festival I would have liked to go down so I went down and again walked into the bar on Saturday down in uh, Nina the Paddy O'Brien festival and you see and uh, we had these if I had one of these cameras that day <laughs> I would have been part of a very very big historical photograph so that day uh, in, in that room, it was Eileen O'Brien, Paddy Fahey, Andy McGann, Joe Burke, uh, Tony and Anne, and Anne, and myself and a few more, Deirdre McSherry, a girl that plays the flute there. And, like, you know, so uh, I, was, I, was, I was bought over by that type of music. So the love for it, and I kept going over and back to St. Louis, um, and 
Uh, then I was asked to do a radio programme with uh, Rita and Sarah Kane, Dolores and Hans, and I went down to do that. And that was another, I mean, you know, you're just, you're, you're, you're in with the cream on top of the cake all the time. I went down and done that for Midwest Radio, and we had a fantastic night of singing and music in the Kane's house. Um, that night there, there was a man, uh, two men, they were twins, uh, Tom and Dick Joyce from Hedford. Tom had a pub in Hedford, and he asked me would I go down to play there in his pub some night. So I went down, and so I played the music there, and so I went down another night to play, and as I did, uh, I got talking to this girl for a few minutes, and it was my future wife at the time, I didn't realise, that was Tom's niece, Elaine. And um, I moved off again to America for when we kept in contact with each other, and I was in St. Louis, and... When I was coming back from St. Louis, I said, you know, I think this might be the last time now my venture. I, I, I don't tell this woman now and see. <laughs> can, we, can we get together? So that's, we met and we, we started, uh, we started uh, seeing each other and 1998 came and we got married. So that's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the music had a big part in it, you know, yeah. but I, I was delighted it did. And um, I suppose the funny thing for me, and, uh, and this is not um, I've been disrespectful to anybody, I didn't go through that scenario of, of learning. Like, I would always have l- learned, I would always have wished to be able to play, you know, fiddle or an accordion or a banjo or to play the tunes, because I was really, really got by the tunes. The tunes uh, were taking me more than the songs, even though the songs were natural when I started to sing or... I always got the tunes, you know, I was, you know, the turn of them, the, the, the history of them, uh, who had written them, um, you know, the, the, why they were written, the different parts of the country, uh, the different styles and all that. But um, later on in life, I, I kind of, I have a flute at home and I do play uh, at, at the house when there's no one looking. I have so I, I'd I, forgotten about this. Yeah, yeah, I play, yeah, I play yeah, it and yeah. I got a lovely flute made for me there by Marcus Hernan. Uh, you know, so it's handmade for me, especially, and uh, it's it's beautiful instrument, and um, we love the flute. Um, so when everyone has gone out of the house, I'll, I'll take it out and I'll start knocking out a bit of <laughs> Willie Coleman's on Christmas Eve and <laughs> <laughs> lovely a few of them. Did you have to? Did you have to figure out how to back Irish music? I did, I did, I did. Uh, the in, the introductory I got actually now in the from playing. Back in music, there was only one other man in our area in Bormore that played music. It was a man called Tommy Nolan, and Tommy played the fiddle. He also played a bit of an accordion, but Tommy was very famous, like go back 40, 50, 60 years ago. Everyone in the music scene around Galway knew Tommy and played with Tommy. And Tommy used to play in a place called Cullens on Foster Street, and he played in O'Malley's, he played in Cook's, played in the Atlanta Hotel, and he played with Sean Divney for years. And... You know, when, I, when he knew I was playing the guitar, when Sean would go on holidays, I was young at the time, he'd asked me to come down and back him for a few tunes and sing a song. So I forgot to leave out that part now when I was talking to you earlier. But um, it gave me a little bit of confidence. But, you know, Tom, Tommy would play the tunes all the time, so I'd be... You know, he was saying to me, you're all right now, two, two chords, you're fine. You know, just <laughs> just watch, the, watch my foot and watch the rhythm and just keep your hand going down with the foot. And after a while, then other lads would be joining, I'd be watching them, how they'd be back, how they'd be back in as well. And um, so I, I, could I say I got it eventually? I don't know did I ever have it, but... Who, t- um, who touches the third card? <laughs> 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 For the three-card trick. <laughs> I don't know, some, some person on, on, on TV, maybe Paul Brady, looking at Paul Brady. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was watching Paul Brady, and I knew with a different tuning completely. And it's only then... Um, I got talking to Pat Kime one time and, and Pat would be, you know, singing. Pat now would have play, played with Sean Kane, the singer. And um, I knew Pat was playing a different, open kind of a tuning altogether. It sounded way nice. It sounded like a bazooki. So I was asking Pat what was going on. So he said, this is open tuning entirely. It's different to concert tuning. So it's what they call open D or dad gaddis. He said, that's what they call it. So I went down to Pat and we messed around for a while and he showed me a few things. So... That's the kind of style I play today. Mm. I play Dead Get all the time. Uh, rarely I, I go back to the concert tuning. Now and again, um, if if I was doing songs that didn't lay itself to the uh, to the Dead Get, uh, um, I take about 
it's 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 the open the open deed that I, the open the open dad gathers we said that's what I play now. Yeah. It's lovely. It's nice for it's nice for traditional music, you know, because there's a drop D in it, I suppose, and it's yeah, it's just, very easy. yeah, it's very round. It is, isn't it? It, it is. Of, it's yeah, very it yeah. holds the music very it well. It does. It does, and yeah. it's an o- it's 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 an it's an open sound. It gets a little bit difficult when you. When you have to go up the keys, you know, when you go up yeah. to the B minors and the C's, you have a cap all really up tight up the neck and yeah. you have to watch on the tune and all that. Yeah. But other There's than a little that, bit of body up there as well. Yeah, it? yeah, it yeah. loses, yeah, yeah. the intonation yeah. goes a small bit. But in saying that, yeah, I, I'm i planning now, I'm doing a few things at the minute, so I'm planning to bring in my other guitar for the concert pitch again for certain songs just because, you know, when you're writing songs, you, you could write a song, uh, you, you know, I could be putting a song together in my head, I could be in... Uh, the dad get if I try to do that song with the with, with the concert it just doesn't work at all so uh, certain songs for different tunings so yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. do you have a big repertoire of songs uh, well I do I have a good fairly good repertoire of songs uh, but um, a lot of them would be songs that I would have been singing for years you know and there was a stage in my life when I was writing a nice bit and then I got completely out of it for instance during the Covid people would have said you know here's a time now that you'd be able to write a lot of music and write songs and the opposite happened to me you know I just I, I couldn't um, I didn't even I, I, I don't think I even picked up the instrument that much at all during the Covid even at home we weren't out and of course as you know as a professional musician that's our work and all of a sudden we have no work we can't go anywhere, we can't travel, and we can't uh, go into restaurants or bars or anything like that. And uh, the entertainment business got really hit hard with the COVID, but I kind of went outside and went gardening. So that's that's where my kind of thing happened over the COVID. Uh, vegetables and sown potatoes and onions, and that came from home in Bohemore, you know. I was used to seeing that as, as a young lad going on in, in our own house. So I said I'd pick it up again, and a bit of help from... From my uh, brother-in-laws and father-in-law, their stuff. Uh, so, but I, I, I just, um, I have written a song um, when I was in Newfoundland there a couple of years ago. I don't know where it is. It's at home someplace, and I'll find it. But I want to find it because I, it's, it's a song I know that will relate to the people around Saint John's in Newfoundland, and it relates to me because I've been there now, and I've been there a few times, and then people out there are so. F- there's so much into music, more singing and the old Irish tradition of house parties and house dances and stuff like that. So uh, if I can get that one, maybe now 2024 20, might get my hand up a <laughs> bit higher and down onto the table again to start writing. I would like to write again. In the, yeah. 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 I, I find it very hard. Like if you said to me now, go away for a week now and write some music, I can't really do that. Mm. I know it's the old cliche, it has to come into your head, but for me it really does. Do you know, I have to be taken by something that touches me. Uh, and then, hopefully, if that happens, I might be able to put a few together, mm. you know. so. How did the uh, Cherish the Ladies uh, gig come along? Cherish the Ladies gig came along. Um, I met Joni Madden the first time ever, I'd say, in the early 90s. Joni briefly remember remembers the day we met but it was in the company of Joe Burke and Anne we were coming back from St Louis we had a connection flight in New York and Joni and her band were going someplace in JFK they were heading off and sure Joni and Joe once they met they know each other so well so we were roaring and shouting and screaming and hugging and laughing and uh, Joe and Anne introduced me to Joni and it was kind of only hello and how are you and that was it but after a while then uh, there's a there's a, there's a family in New York that are comedies. They're they're um, uh, their people are from uh, their people are from from a place called Glantraig in Galway, and from Donegal. Uh, they had a tape belong to me, and they got their hands on a cassette tape. And I was telling you a while ago about the radio program that we done in the Keynes House, but that was recorded and made into a couple of cassettes. They got their hands on it. I don't know how they did, but they had that tape and. Joni Madden's father, Joe, God rest him, heard the tape and he had it and he was listening to it and he called over to Joni one day and he gave her the tape and he, by God, he said, you want to hear this fella singing? <laughs> God, you want that fella comes over around America, you want to mm. hook up with him or get him? So, God, she reached out and um, uh, I, was after making, I was after making the first, uh, the first album in 2006 
Um, and she had heard of me a year or two, two before that through the tapes, but I hadn't... They'd be busy travelling. But anyways, uh, I sent the CD out to a couple of people in America and she got her hands on that start of a dream, that first album. And in all fairness to Joni now, she gave me a load of contacts, people, you know, to hand out radio programmes around... Um, <laughs> around around the she United States. She literally knows every individual in America. I think. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And like, I, I got a lot of contacts. Um, I I remember doing a, ma an interview one time with a good friend of yours, Bill Mardison. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Bill rang me up, and uh, you know he'd done a he'd done a great review on the album for me. People like that's very important to get in contact with them people because they are in the scene all the time. And this was this was Joni put me out on a platform. You know, me not realizing what was going on around me. Even though I had lived in Boston, and we might touch on that in a few minutes, I'd lived in Boston for two and a half years. Um, you had a song about that. I had a song about that, yeah. yeah. But this, this, and that song, Missing Galway, was on that album as well. But, you know, I had a good production uh, with the album. Um, I had Arthur Midlin, I had Carl Hayden, I had Frankie Gavin, I had Pat Coyne, uh, Sharon Shannon. Couldn't find uh, any good musicians. Yeah, I couldn't get anyone good at all. <laughs> And again, you know, um, so Joni just reached out and she said, look, uh, we're playing in the Cleveland Irish Festival. She said, there's other things out there that you can get little, little gigs on the side for yourself if you're interested in coming out. So I picked up a couple of gigs in Philadelphia around New York, uh, small little sessions. And then I went to Cleveland um, and I'd done uh, a couple of sets with them um, in Cleveland at the, the Cleveland Irish Festival. Um, and then I had a couple of little gigs set up myself with... Uh, Gabriel Dunahoo, Gabriel lives out there now for years. He's originally from Kilkenard and there, um, there between Athan Ryan, Loch Rea and uh, Jimmy Keane, uh, the piano accordion player. And Jimmy came with me as well. And that was fantastic. God almighty, talking about, you know. He's amazing. Company. Yeah, and, and Gabriel, the, the, the two of them. So that was in there with Joni. Um, I was introduced to Joni and the band. Uh, partied and, and, and had the good company there for a while. And I went back and then... She um, she got me on one of the uh, one of the cruises that she was participating in herself. She was doing these cruises for a uh, lady called Mary Rowley, and the Clancy's were doing them. Um, so she she got me on that. Um, went and done that. I'd done another one with Andy Cooney uh, that she cherished ladies were participating in them cruises, and then she decided to do the cruises herself. So I think she is I don't know is it fifteen or fourteen or. More maybe, I, I, I can't remember now, but I've been all the cruises with her and I've done a good few Christmas concerts with her and I've done a lot of stuff, um, you know, around around Ireland and around England and over in Europe as well. So I, I, I've been delighted. They're great. They're a great crew. They're very tight knit. She works hard. Um, she puts, dedicates her life into her music and her profession. And, um, you know, she demands a she demands. She, she demands everyone to be professional. <laughs> And um, I'm happy to be doing that with her because that's if you work that way, you'll get the results and you get the gigs and you get the agents to look in uh, to the outfit, um, as you know yourself. So, um, yeah, I've I'm I'm still I'm still working with them. I'm heading off on a cruise in June. Now we're going to the Ryan uh, a cruise on the River Rhine. Uh, it's a different kind of a thing to the big boats. I think it's about 160 people, and you go down some of the rivers in Europe: uh, Germany, France, Amsterdam. Something like that. And then we're doing the one in the Caribbean. Sounds terrible. The Caribbean, <laughs> this time next year, in 25. Uh, and that and the Christmas shows, yeah. They're, they're, I, I enjoy the exposure, I have to say. Yeah. You know, I mean, you do them gigs. You're, you're in big auditoriums around the States. You know, the America has lots of... They've great college facilities where they have all these auditoriums that you know you've toured them all yourself. And... Um, one of them that sticks out for me was the Troy Savings Bank in, in Troy, which is upstate New York. It's, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, theatre. It, it, it was built really for operatic music, uh, and the stage is kind of thrown out with pipes on it to carry the voices, but the acoustics, I think it's probably the second best acoustic theatre in America, if not the world. But then you get opportunities to sing in these places, and of course we go to Glasgow to the Celtic Connection, sing in the concert hall there over 2,000 people and you know I, I kind of still pinch myself like like the first time I went with Joe God rest Joe and, and Michael Cooney and, and all them people you know it's still 
still like a dream. Like that's why I call my album "Start of a Dream." So the dream is still alive, anyways. Do you like to travel? Um, <laughs> I'm not the best with planes, you know. I'm not the smallest of guys, and and sometimes it can be a bit uncomfortable in long journeys. Uh, um, I've got more used to it as the years progress. Um, I don't mind the shorter journeys, uh, but um, it was a bit harder when, 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 when definitely when the kids were younger and for f- for family life. But I've got to thank Elaine and everyone around her that would kind of cover for me. I mean, she's working too, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm very thankful for all the help around it. Uh, the travel can become just a little, but you know, it just becomes as you get older. It's just uh, so some people love it. I still like it, don't take me wrong, but it's... I'm, I'm beginning to be more of a home bird. <laughs> <laughs> I know more, more time for fishing in there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. you, it's very hard with a family, unless you have some hero at home that's very yeah. solid and is willing to carry everything, you know. Absolutely. So that's it's a, good, a huge sacrifice. Yeah, that's a good word to use, actually. Yeah. Uh, they're forgotten heroes, these people, because... You were on stage getting all the all the applause and all the plaudits, yeah. and and it's hard to do it. Yes, yeah. there's a yeah. great, great uh, You background. need a support mechanism around you to be able to do that. Now, there's a, like, and I'm just talking from a perspective of a married. Other people do it, and they're 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 not married. They're married into the game, but they're dedicated to it. So they make that sacrifice to do that, uh, which is much of the same thing because they're losing out yeah. on other things as well, uh, missing out on family life and children and all that so the sacrifice is everywhere like people just think oh you're going off to the states playing music for a month isn't that great well it is fantastic to go and see all these places but you know into week two you start getting a bit contrary and you start leveling yourself off a bit and you're with other people and you try and give each other a bit of space and you know the magic happens when you're on stage you know that's the easiest part throwing out the music and singing the songs it's it's the whole thing keeping all that together you know uh, but it is enjoyable. I will say, I'm I'm blessed and honoured to, to be in a position and have an opportunity to be able to do that because I'm sure there are a lot of y- quite young musicians looking in at our podcast here. Um, uh, would love to be out doing this game, you know, and eventually the day might come for them. But what I would say to them is, you know, you know, mind that straight road. You know, there's lots of little roads at the side. You know, just be careful and. Be dedicated to what you're doing, and you will enjoy it, you know. Yeah. But young people will be young people. Yeah. <laughs> God, are we all now. <laughs> well, Tell me about fishing. Would you would you would you give up the music if you could make a full time living fishing? Well, I tried for a while at the fishing end. I mean, um, when I moved, I mean, I I had been fishing since I was a child in Galway City. My father fished. He had a boat. We went down there to the commercial boat club and went from there up the river. And we went down to the lake on Loch Horeb. So I've been I've been in a boat, and he had a boat. My dad had a boat with his uh, with his brother, God rest him, uh, Michael John, who was living in Chantilly. So they they used to go for lobsters in the seas. So they were used to being on the water. So I was always used to being around boats and fishing and fresh water, salt water, all that stuff. And then um, when I moved out to Headford, and I kind of. I seen, uh, you know, you're right at the edge of the bigger part of the lake there. So we tried it for a while, uh, but it's very, very time consuming. Um, you know, it's you're talking about the music being dedicated, like if you're running an, an, an angling business, uh, you know, <laughs> there's people coming to your house all the time. You have to be there 24-7. You're there with them last minute before they go to bed. You're there with them early in the morning again. You're setting up that you have enough people to take them out in boats. You're under a little bit of pressure. Uh, pressure. You want to see them getting fish. You know, a wild fishery like like Horeb. It doesn't always guarantee a fish. You know, but it's a fantastic fishery. So uh, then you know, there's there's and again the kids were small. They were going to school. I know it was local. So it just it it didn't it didn't work. It didn't kind of work out. It could have worked out, but it just it didn't it didn't work out for me. There's only there's only a certain amount of months in the year for that. Mm-hmm. Like you have you have April time and you have May when the May fly. You have a bit more after the May fly, what they call this canis fishing. It's very very early morning fishing, and then you might want people to go maybe to the rivers fishing for salmon when the salmon are coming in. So you're kind of talking about two and a half to three months where you can make gold, uh, and it's very hard. Yeah. It's very hard to keep it going all the time, so 
I was just kind of drawn to the music. And then people that were coming to me for the fishing, they knew I was involved in the music. They wanted to go out at night time, bring them to a music session. You've been on the lake all day, and now you're going out <laughs> playing music, and you're uh, in the middle of the song. And you're <laughs> so it's kind of one or the other. So what I made a decision to say, fishing will be what it always has been to me, a tradition that was handed down to me uh, by the people that went before me, a love for it, a love for... Lock Horrible Love for trout fishing, salmon fishing. And, uh, you know, to start making that your job t- all the time, you would probably lose your love for it, you know. And for me, certainly, I could kind of see that coming in. Um, so I, I prefer to go out now there and sit around the islands, light your fire, watch the wildlife, you know, watch the migratory birds that's coming in. Not too many of them now at the minute, but, you know, You'd fish for a while and you'd have some company maybe, you know. I'd, I'm at the stage you now where I was like someone with me in the boat, you know. But um, I have a passion and I, I have a love for it. I, I, I have a love for what's been handed down to us on, on that lake and I have I have a love for preserving it and keeping the, keeping the stocks that are there, keep them replenished uh, and try and um, mine them, uh, try and keep the water quality good yeah. if we can. That's a struggle with us. You're you're very active on that. Front. Yeah, I'm, I'm active on that. That I'm involved with certain committees, and we've been approached by different programs, TV programs, to expose from an angling point of view people that are on the lake all the time. What are the changes we see down through the years? Like for instance, fifty years ago, you could put your kettle uh, out of the boat and put just put it in the water and bring it into the island and boil it. And you can't do that now because there's continuous cryptosporidium, which is um, you know it's a kind of a disease that comes from animals that's conserved in the water now. Um, and there's other, there's algae blooms at the minute, toxic algae blooms that are coming from hot weather and climate change because the temperature seems to be rising all the time. And what we've started to do in our own area now is we work with the local farmers. Uh, they're custodians of the land. And people give the farmers a hard time and odd time. You know, they're, they're trying their best. You know, they're, they're, they have the water and the river's going through their land. So when we go to them and explain to them that we can apply for a grant to our angling club to help fence off the river, uh, to keep the cattle away from it, uh, we'd build a kind of a, a water truck for them that would be run by a solar panel and then that we give a chance, clean up the river, put trees up along for shading to cool down the stream and that the trout, the wild trout can come back in spawning and all that. So they want to be a part of that biodiversity, you know. Um, yeah, they, I do, know, they do get a bad press. They it's do like get they're, a, they're just going around emptying... Um, you know, they do, and you know, yeah. there's you see where because Lock Horrib is a, is an SAC special area conf- uh, conservation, uh, there are buffer zones there, and um, a lot of farmers are uh, ill in advised. You know, they're, they're some of them would be the lake could be four or five fields away from them. They don't realize that maybe they're putting a story out there that they shouldn't be. Doing. Most of them, most of them are very cognizant about what they're doing, but some of them don't understand what the pre- repercussions are for effluent going down, seeping down into a water course and stuff over a period of years. I mean, a view of, a view of effluent, and it could be coming from a factory or, 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 or construction plant or septic tanks just as well. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no point in hammering the, the farmer down the head, but a view of intensive farming in an area all the time and it's a cycle and it's going out. If it's in a buffer zone where there's water channels and rivers, in time, in time, it's slow. It's a slow little death that goes into the river. You know, these algae blooms build up and the phosphates go into the river and the water. Um, and they build up and, and it affects the small little trout fry because if ammonium levels and stuff like that start to rise in the streams, the, the, the young trout can't handle it. The same for the salmon when they come in from the Atlantic. You know, they, they, uh, I think a climate... A climate a climate effect has more effect on migratory fish like salmon because they're coming in from the sea where the ocean is warming up as well. Mm-hmm. So they're finding it hard to find food. Some of them then the, in, the, in the waters over the past few years were dealing with kind of invasive species as well, different things that comes in, invasive weed species. We have invasive fish species as well that come in. And, you know, there's, a, there's an argument there to trying to balance, you know, uh, <laughs> who's right and who's wrong with invasive species, but in an SAC where you're governed by the Habitats Directive, you have to give the native fish, the salmonids, they have to be given protection because they won't withstand uh, being predated upon by non-native fish and stuff like that. It has to be controlled. Yeah, I see this on Facebook. It's very contentious. What's the cormorant situation like? 
Well, it's funny you bring that up now, Winda. I today is whatever 21st it is. First of February. Yeah, today is the twenty first <laughs> of February, Wednesday. I was on the lake fishing on Sunday, and I came down to a point not far from where I live. We shoved out the boat, and we now it's nice and easy. There was twelve or thirteen cormorants just on the point in that one particular spot. Now, the National Parks and Wildlife people will tell us that they're there, but they're not there in huge volumes. But they are there in huge volumes. I mean, they're really predating heavily on, I don't know, they're, they're definitely hitting, I know in other parts of the country, up north, they're definitely hitting uh, trout and salmon in the rivers. Mm. I know there's roach populations out on the Carib, maybe they find them balls and they go feeding on them, but they're definitely cropping trout and stuff. Uh, I don't know because I don't have the science for it. I could give you the signs on what pike eat and stuff like that, with some, but as regards cormorants, because they're protected, mm. so you can't you can't open a cormorant and and, and see what's <laughs> what, what, what's in it. But I just know, like as you as you said yourself, you're fifty years on the lake, so you know the changes because you're you're on it so much. Yes. So I've started fishing, uh, you know, on the rivers, of course, yeah. but also off, off the rocks in Connemara. Yes. And I've seen, like, over the years, the amount of cormorant that are around seems yeah. to have exploded. Yes, well, they have really, they've really exploded. Um, I think the people on the sea call them the, sh- uh, uh, the shag. That's what they call them there. But same, same, same bird. The reason why they're coming into the lakes now, there's a discussion at the moment, is that around Galway Bay, the, like, that whole bay is decimated of fish. I mean, even mackerel stocks coming in or down, there isn't as much pollock, there isn't as much herd and fry. And they're saying, the people that are having the discussion, that these birds are moving inland now to the inland lakes. Mm. Uh, you'll see big co- connollies of them uh, down in Limerick. If you're driving through Limerick, you'll see them on the left-hand side. There's a sanctuary there, and they're all over the place there. Now, in nature, people will say they're entitled to be there, and they're a native bird. But you have to be careful of how the ecology um, has been affected and stuff like that. So we, we have to be cognizant of what's happening in our native fish, like lamprey, the, the salmon, the trout, um, you know, the otter, all these things, uh, they're, they're protected. But definitely, I can tell you, uh, my experience been on the lake for years and years and years, cormorants have become hugely prevalent in Loch Corrib. I'm not sure about mask, I don't be on mask an awful lot, but I can tell you, they're... On Sunday, I think I counted over 30 in the whole process of the day. We, we need a cormorant to come in and put manners in the dog. Ah, he, yeah, he's, he's meant to get fishing, that's all that's what he means. <laughs> He'd be frightened if he's saw fish. <laughs> <laughs> Will you sing yeah. a song for me? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, lovely. I could do, yeah. I do this song mostly this time of the year, because, uh, February and March time, because uh, it's kind of about the daffodils. It's also kind of uh, been uh, reverts back to what we were talking about a while ago. Been away from people uh, in our job as been a musician, and um, I wrote the song uh, while I was sitting uh, anchored up on one of those big cruise ships in front of Cuba, um, and Havana was in because one of the, I asked one of the porters what was part of Cuba was that he said that's Havana, and the sun was going down. You could see the. You could see the kind of silhouette off the beaches, the golden beaches, and the, the sun was starting to go down. It was something like 95 or 90 something degrees in the evening in February. And back home, uh, it was kind of minus three or minus four. I'd been talking to Elaine about it, and you know, she was, and I just said, oh, God, I wish I was back home, you know, at the minute. And she was saying, Oh, God, yeah, and the old daffodils are starting to, starting to bud and all that. So, um, so I was sitting in my, in my little veranda on my chair. And I was watching the sun going down over Havana and Cuba, and I wrote this little song called The Promise of Spring. So. Oh, the sand, it is gold, and the ocean is blue, and the hills of Havana are still. When I look to the sky, what a tear in and your lips on my face softly fill And your heart's far away I miss you each day When I look at my gold wedding ring Oh, but I'll see you soon Where the
the daffodils bloom And we'll meet for the promise of spring Now I'm here on my own And it feels all alone There's people of all kinds of creed I don't know their names We greet just the same But it's your sweet caress that I need And your heart's far away I miss you when I look at my gold wedding ring Oh, but I'll see you soon Where the daffodils bloom And we'll meet for the promise of spring As the sun falls away To find a new day I can feel the warm breeze on my face And it carries your scent and your whispers to me Soon we'll be in our own special place And your heart's far away I miss you each day Daffodils bloom, and we'll meet for the promise of spring. As I lie in your arms by the open turf fire, with a sense of contentment and joy, where the daffodils sway in their meadows. I will love you through the day that I die. <laughs> you? Yeah, the promise you? of spring. Where can people find out about you? Ah, uh, well, I have a website. I don't know if it working or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> www.tonstiff.com um, I didn't I didn't update that since the COVID so I, I'll have to um, Facebook really is where I'm at that's where um, um, Don Stiff Music yeah